Welcome to the Online Great Books Podcast, brought to you by OnlineGreatBooks.com, where we talk about the good life, the great books, great conversation, and great ideas. Hi, uh, this is Brett Vinat. I am the producer of the Online Great Books podcast, and I'm also a participant in today's conversation. Now, as the producer of a high-quality and wildly popular podcast like Online Great Books, I can certainly offer some expertise and tell you, when you add a third person to the mix in podcasting, you increase the variables. There's a greater chance of something going wrong. And for some reason here, we don't have the first minute of Scott's audio, but this conversation opens up with Scott discussing uh, some constructive criticism that he receives somewhat frequently. Basically, why do you guys only read things that you like? If you're the person who wrote that, or if you share that criticism, I have some great news about today's show. We're going to be discussing Saul Alinsky's Rules for Radicals. And this conversation actually stretched almost three hours, so we are going to split it into two parts. You will get a frustrating cliffhanger this week. Please check back next Thursday for the second half of this show. So we'll join the conversation already in progress. Scott has just finished speaking about reading things you don't like, and Carl picks it up from there. So thanks for listening. This is part one of Rules for Radicals by Saul Alinsky. That's kind of the way I read, too. Even when it's something I don't agree with, I'm always um, trying to figure out how I could agree with it. I think that's a reasonable way to do it. That's one of the things I like about our third wheel today. Mm. on his show, The School Sucks podcast, that he'll he'll say something and then he'll say, well, wait a minute. you know, And then he'll argue with himself and, and figure out why, you know, why this is good, why people would find it to be good. He's always so measured. <laughs> well, I'll do my best to correct for that today, but I first dug into this book back in like 2016 as a way to attack both sides of the political spectrum, a lot of stuff I was seeing leading up to and right after the uh, election of the current president. I don't think I dug into it carefully enough at that time. Uh, I would say you could give it an optimistic treatment, like it's real world tactics for changing the status quo. Does that sound nice and fair? Yep. Or optimistic, at least. And more cynically, and I think more applicably, it is a non-ideologically driven, uh, slogan-rich quest for power, relying on ridicule and polarization, mm. uh, happening in an environment where widespread rationality is not going to be a factor. <laughs> so, you know, interesting tie-ins to Bernays right there. I mean, you sure. go through and you read a bunch of the quotes from propaganda about what Bernays had to say about the average person, and there are so many echoes of that in Rules for Radicals, at least in his approach. Oh, for sure. It, it's a, a sophist's guide. It's Brasimicus from book one of the Republic, if you wrote a book. Mm -hmm. This is how to influence people and get what you want. But what it does, he claims not to have an agenda. He claims not to have a morality. It's all supposed to be tactics that you can use in any situation, uh, except that, well, they're kind of they're kind of mean tactics. You know, I, I don't know that the tactics are themselves morally neutral. That's a moral claim in itself to say that I can freeze you, isolate you, demonize you. That's the one that that uh, Hannity quotes all the time. I'm not sure Hannity read past the first page, but that's the one that he always talks about with Alinsky is this you, you freeze your opposition. I don't know that you can do that in a good way. I had a guy on Instagram. He said, what are you guys going to record about today? Because people know we record on Thursdays. And I said, Saul Alinsky's Rules for Radicals. And this guy is a staffer. He's a senior advisor to a United States senator. I don't want to dox him at all. He's a good, good man. He sends me all kinds of interesting things. He said that this book promotes disorder in society. And when I, when I read it, that's not what I got. I'm not saying my friend is wrong. Uh, but if everybody acted like Alinsky does, you know, you're freezing, you're isolating, you're ostracizing, you're, you know, you're farting in the theater. We'll talk about some of these things he's talking about. <laughs> like, how can you have a society if everyone acted the way he does? And uh, the Aristotelian part of me says, if somebody is acting in a way that would be unacceptable if everyone acted in that way, then that is the wrong thing to do. 
if Brett throws stink bombs everywhere he goes in order to get the right thing to happen. But if everyone threw stink bombs, we would never have anything nice. <laughs> then you can't throw stink bombs. So I, I really struggled with the whole means uh, justifying by their ends. And and he knows this is a big problem. It's I think it's the second chapter in the book. I'm just beside myself over this thing. Well, back to what Carl said a minute ago, you know, these are tactics that don't have a philosophy or ideology attached to them allegedly, right? They're just passed along and they might be, you know, we could consider them unethical or uh, mean, right? Mm -hmm. But not to the recipient, because obviously if, uh, you know, Alinsky's worldview is correct, the recipient is obviously morally justified in anything they do. So these tactics are just the necessary means to the ends and uh, or to the end, whatever the end might be. You know, he was a small C communist, self-identified, but he was also such an apparent individualist that he never publicly aligned himself with any political group or cause, really. And I do think this book is accessible to any ideological group or any political party, and I think we can demonstrate that today by showing who has used many of the principles in this book most effectively in the last decade, <laughs> and it's not the people we would accuse uh, Alinsky of being allied with, I would say. Yeah, famously, or at least apocryphally, the Tea Party uh, movement spent a great deal of time, the leaders of the Tea Party movement spent a lot of time with this book, and got some traction as a result. To your point about you know who's using the book, uh, it's not who necessarily you would think is using them. Just as you could use propaganda to get people to uh, brush their teeth and reduce teeth, tooth decay, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. this book could be used for for good rather than evil. Uh, this same this same friend of mine, who's this staffer I was telling you about, he said, "I'm going to send you something and you have a look at it." Uh, this was in the context of our Alinsky discussion, and he sent me what I think is the Koch brothers, the Charles Koch Institute's playbook for the next five years, and they call it market-based management, applying the principles of free societies to organizations, a learner resource kit. That 100-page document about how they are trying to organize to move their political aims forward. I've just started breezing through this thing, and uh, it's about organization, and that's what this book is about. Uh, Alinsky is talking about organizing, organizing, organizing. You know, community organizer in Oklahoma is a cuss word. Uh, you wouldn't call somebody's mom that, but he <laughs> is all about community organizing. And uh, the Koch brothers have a guide here about applying principles of free societies to organizations. Well, what does it mean to organize? To uh, I think for Alinsky, it would mean identifying a group of people who are disenfranchised for various purposes and organizing the power that they have, whatever that may be, in order to transgress societal norms, in order to move them from a state of disenfranchisement to one of enfranchisement. And he says that organizations that address more problems are bigger. Did you catch that in there? He says the more issues that your organization addresses, the more people that will be in that organization, the more power it will have. And when I read that, I thought, oh, reading that, and in conjunction with him saying that you know, he doesn't really have an ideology and all that. He does have an ideology, and that is to transgress societal norm. If society is a certain way, he wants it broken. He wants that broken and rearranged in a new way. Transgression is the highest ideal for this guy. <laughs> I have two thoughts. One is uh, I think this is kind of like a poisoner's manual. Mm hmm and I wonder if you can use it in a good way. I think so. I have plans to. We'll talk about that <laughs> after the show. <laughs> but, you know, I come at it from a scholastic tradition. That's what, what I studied in philosophy. And for Aquinas, some means are just forbidden because their nature is bad. Mm -hmm. So uh, the act itself, there are some acts that you can't do well. Marital relations with your, your wife are a good thing. Doing them in the town square is a bad thing. Okay. Adultery is a bad thing. doesn't matter where you do it. You know, some things just aren't good. Yeah. Aristotle says you behave according to the mean. 
but there's not yeah. just enough rape. Like you just don't do that. There's no mean, there's no moderation in terms of rape and certain other things. Which, so he puts prohibitions on things too. Well, it's like a, the, the debates in the last few years about torture as whether it's ever permitted. I think Alinsky would be like, well, if you need to. Yeah. Yeah. He says on page 22, this is not an ideological book except insofar as argument for change rather than for the status quo can be called an ideology. Different people in different places and different situations and different times will construct their own solutions and symbols of salvation for those times. This book will not contain any panacea or dogma. I detest and fear dogma. And he goes on, but he's claiming that it's not, it's not a communist book. It's not a, it's not an anything book. It's just how to do your stuff. Yeah, but he didn't consult for the John Birch Society, though. No, and you can see, like, the academic tradition of, you know, deconstruction and postmodernism and maybe even more specifically the, the Frankfurt School, which was related to that, in his writing. And you also see, well, I think a lot of the things that he lays out in this book might be in instinctive for those who are on some kind of quest for power. He is kind of making it explicit and concrete with his rules. And in many ways, it seems like he is memorializing a lot of 1960s student activism and, and, and just sort of giving that more of a shape than it might have actually had as he was observing it just years before he wrote this book. So let's go to Chicago for an example, where I think he was working in writing and spending most of his life and then inspiring people also from Chicago to pick up the mantle and move forward. And I'm sure we'll talk about that as well. But 1968, the uh, Democratic National Convention is happening in Chicago. Lyndon Johnson is the sitting president of the United States. He says he's not seeking reelection. And this results in some upheaval. It is during the civil rights movement. It is during the Vietnam War. There's just been super high profile, like lots in the last five years, lots of high profile political assassinations. And who is going to pick up the mantle of the Democratic Party? Is it going to be the status quo, continue the war in Vietnam, continue race, race relations as they are, embodied by the guy who becomes the nominee in Humphrey, or is it going to pass to somebody who's more radical in, um, I think it was McGovern, right? And there's lots of student protests, mostly around the Vietnam War and the party support, continued support or continued prosecution of the Vietnam War. Students take to the streets where they're, you know, beaten down by Daly's Chicago police. Daly was the mayor at the time. And in the midst of all of this, while the convention is happening and they're outside protesting, as they're being beaten and dragged into police vans, they begin chanting, the whole world is watching. And I think this is one of the most key principles in this, but it's it's one of his rules that if you push on a negative long enough, it sort of transforms into a positive, right? When you have these people being arrested by the police, clearly establishing their underdog status, that is not a chant of, oh, woe is us, isn't this sad that this is the scene in Chicago? The whole world is watching is celebration. Right. The whole world is seeing this. The whole world is seeing who the good guys and bad guys are here. And they are forced to pick a side. Right. I think that's one of the that perception is being managed and people have to pick a side are two of the most important principles. And also when you get into his trinity of the haves, the have nots, who lines up with what group there in that 1968 scene. So just long story long, it seems like he is looking at a lot of the things that had transpired in the country over the previous, um, you know, five, five to 10 years. And he, he is very much picking sides, even though he's never explicitly stating it in this book. Yeah, and, and his, his tactics are a propaganda life hack. You know, <laughs> so, so you got these young people getting arrested and put in the paddy wagon and being hauled off, and they're yelling, the whole world is watching. So that tactic works, still works. What if the protesters are protesting because they don't want Brett Vinat to have free speech because he wants people to educate their own children and is subverting the public education agenda. You give a speech and they show up and they're picketing and they get a little bit violent and aren't respecting the property of the venue owner. And then your mayor has them hauled off and they're saying the whole world is watching and it's hacking the empathy of the sort of half disinterested moderate class that watches that on television. 
Well, there's a problem. So I was looking at the tactics and I was mining them for things that I could do too. But I thought the whole world watching thing might be short circuited right now. So let's say we're going to do a hypothetical. Brett goes and gives a speech uh, and there is fights outside. I like how this is all Brett. Yeah. Well, he's the public figure. We're, right. we're not much. And you go give a speech and there's a fight outside and your friends go to jail. Okay. For the fight. And they say the whole world's watching, but nobody's watching. And the socials shut it down because they determine that you're an enemy of the people. And you can't talk. You can say all you want in the streets, but nobody listens on the streets. They all listen on their cell phone. What comes in their Facebook feed and Facebook locks it down. How can you use these strategies if nobody's watching, if it can just be completely shut down? Yeah, th those large-scale acts, so we're already at the end of the book here. <laughs> His book doesn't give you specific plays. It gives you a framework for deciding how to use what power you do have effectively. And if those large-scale events like the, the Chicago 1968 thing or the, the fight in front of Brett's speech like you just talked about, if that doesn't work, then you have to do, do something different. That sort of protest won't work anymore if, mm -hmm. if it won't be broadcast. You have to bring pressure to bear in a more granular way on, frankly, the have littles, boring moderate who rides the fence, and you've got to find a way to make them pick your side of the fence. You know, I've been thinking a lot about this because my side of the fence is the best side. <laughs> and uh yeah I, well, we all well, think we that could, we can need to talk we need to talk about that some more but i want to go to the text because we could talk about interesting things all day but i, I want to read this very first thing from the ugh. he quotes thomas Paine right at the very beginning of the book he says uh, let them call me a rebel and welcome i feel no concern from it but i should suffer the misery of devils were i to make a whore of my soul thomas Paine. and then uh, being alinsky he quotes himself he says, lest we forget at least an over-the-shoulder acknowledgement to the very first radical from all our legends, mythology, and history, and who is to know where mythology leaves off and history begins, or which is which, the first radical known to man who rebelled against the establishment and did so effectively that he at least won his own kingdom, Lucifer. What the fuck is this guy? <laughs> I have uh, opened the, uh, the bio in some interview he did with Playboy, if there's an afterlife and have anything to say about it, I will unreservedly choose to go to hell. Playboy says, why? Hell would be heaven for me. All my life I've been with the have-nots. Over here, if you're a have-not, you're short of dough. If you're a have-not in hell, you're short of virtue. Once I get into hell, I'll start organizing the have-nots over there because they're my kind of people. Is he serious? Is this spinal tap? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I lots so. of bands don't take the devil worship seriously. <laughs> was Alinsky serious about this uh, or is he just poking at conventional morality that's a line that Hannity quotes all the time the beginning that dedication to Lucifer mm. well you said his ideology is to it's transgressive. I'm going to translate it's to break stuff mm -hmm. if there's an ideology he, he says I, I can't give you a specific definition he says all of our all of our goals need to be vague because what you have to like work for empowerment or you have to work for the rights of the people. You can't say we're working for a 10 cent increase in your hourly wage. It's right. too small. It's too specific. It has to be, you know, vague. In other words, it, it, for me, I always think of, is there a goal to progressivism? Usually the left, if you try to pin the left down on numbers, there's never any numbers. No. And you, the thought experiment that you could run is just to say, okay, where is your end point? You picture lots of people who line up on that side and you say, okay, when does the day come and what does that beautiful day look like where this person is happy, where this person <laughs> right. is, is, is satisfied? It's never coming. I understand that the, that kind of looks maybe a little bit like a slippery slope fallacy, but I, I think it's been proven pretty true over the last 30 years. The push is always continuous. That's what the motivation is. That's what the project is, is to progress. So once one goal is reached, it's like, this is the new platform. This is the new foundation. Where do we push next? Yeah. Or as Hambrick calls it, transgress, progress, transgress, cross the line, right? There, yep. There's no, whatever the line is, wherever it is this year, we're going to organize and bust through it. Mm-hmm. That for me is problem. I almost said problematic. Uh, watch Scott. it. 
We'll watch it. <laughs> that for me is a problem. If you're going to uh, do a revolution, first he says you have to work inside the system. I think that's actually good advice. It doesn't do any good for me to be an internet nut job if I actually want to accomplish anything. I have to go where the people are. Page 13 of my edition in the introduction. Any re revolutionary change must be preceded by a passive, affirmative, non-challenging attitude toward change among the mass of our people. They must feel so frustrated, so defeated, so lost, so futureless in the prevailing system that they are willing to let go of the past and chance the future. So that becomes part of your program is to make people upset, to make them depressed. We'll so, I mean, I, I would hate to see any connections to our current situation, but <laughs> you get people so they might be well fed, you know, well clothed, well sheltered. You have to make them feel like they're not. Yeah, I think it, one of the lines in the book is the first step in community organization is community disorganization. That's stirring. And it can't just be, I mean, it, it's hard to like apply this book where he's looking at like the 60s and the early 70s perfectly and scale it to the world of today. But yeah, I think there are a lot of translations where it's like that has to be if it's bigger than a labor issue or an actual community or city level issue to some kind of national issue, if you want to scale it that way. Sometimes the disruption, the stirring needs to go on a little bit longer and it needs to be a little bit more continuous. And I think we see a lot of that throughout media that is supportive of these kinds of projects today. It's like this ongoing agitation. Mm -hmm. The thing that ended the Vietnam War was probably Cronkite talking about it and showing the the videos. Otherwise, nobody would have known about it. Nobody would have been discontented. That's how they organize. This is horrible. You know, I follow a meme account on Instagram, a, a, <laughs> a history meme account, and he's got like, uh, it's, <laughs> it's an old timey picture of a father coming home. And then like the wife and kids are there with, with knives because they've just made dinner or something. But he labels it Vietnam soldier who was drafted coming home. And then it's like people saying baby killer and, and fascist. And, mm -hmm. But that was it. You had to make everybody discontent in order to get movement on that. It's not even the worst thing if you are making an enemy out of widespread apathy. Just, it just depends on what your goals are, right? Like it's a nice starting point. I like to think that I try to, the best I can, share that project if that was a real uh, desire that people like Alinsky had was to like fight against apathy a little bit mm -hmm. because there's too much of it and it's a it, it's a huge problem and when we talk about you know his his trinity of the haves the have nots and then in the be in the middle th like this is his class system he calls it the trinity there's the have a little want more right and it all kind of depends on what that group's going to do as far as like how the bigger picture of things shake out that group in the middle so. One of the properties of that group is apathy because they're kind of like, ah, I like where I like to pretend that I'm into like fighting for some cause or social justice or whatever. Mm -hmm. I like to signal that way. But gosh, uh, I certainly hope Joe Biden becomes president and nothing really gets disrupted here. You know, like I really um, glad we dodged a bullet with the Bernie or somebody more radical and it looks like. You know, I will know how to go forward and things. But that's that's apathy, yeah. right? That is yeah. a kind of apathy that he was trying to basically fight against. Yeah. That class maps on to what we would normally just call the middle class, mostly. Exactly, yeah. And in the back of the book, he talks a little bit about how you might approach activizing, organizing, whatever, radicalizing the middle class. And I think he kind of... Well, a lot of people have made a great study of this book. Uh, famously, Hillary Clinton, I think, wrote her thesis on this thing. Boomers on the left in politics spent a lot of time with this book. When I was reading him talking about those that, that trinity and the have a little want mores, I was thinking, well, the middle class just keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And I thought, oh, well, of course, the, the easiest way to deal with them would be just to just completely destroy that class and move them all to the have, have littles or have nothings because it's really hard to get somebody upset and make them uh, risk stuff. If they just bought a new sea there's been great interest, I think in hollowing out that class and just reducing the number of those people. 
you don't think just through like perception management you can get more people at that level or or that that comfort level right in the middle there to buy into these things by I mean this whole idea of virtue signaling right just that's just become so mm-hmm. cliche and overused in the last five or so years is about this I'd like I am signaling that I'm a good person because I do these things and we we've seen people's identities and this is middle and upper class mm-hmm. people there and and I don't think it's just a, a creature of the left I think there's obviously a, a right wing version of it in this country as well I'm a good person because I signal these things That's I think right. it's more it, like just because there's so much more left wing presence in the media and on social media and in entertainment it shows up as being more obnoxious there and and more widespread there but there's a right wing version of it too oh, there's a libertarian version of it we need to talk about but yes. the libertarians the libertarians are the worst <laughs> about it they might be when the um SJWs and the progressive movement really started to get more amplification uh like maybe 5 or 6 years ago i said look at this this is a mirror that we should look in if you know if we're concerned about outreach because we to to an outsider a lot of what's going on in this libertarian movement looks and feels to an outsider a lot like what these people are doing to annoy us all so much right now but no. but uh, no, you're you're right about that. The the virtue signaling is something that people in the middle class and upper middle class and so on can do at little risk. It is a little piece of power that the transgressive activists can wield. But one more sure. thing about it, real quick, Go ahead. just yeah. to to insert this: people through the way media work today, mostly social media and this meme culture, I think there has become a tighter link between people's political identity and their actual identity. Um, and I, I know there's an echo chamber effect that contributes to this as well. But when I'm when I'm talking about getting the have a little want mores or the middle class or the virtue signalers only, the say a lot and do nothing actually crowd in the middle there, mm-hmm. there does seem like there has been an effort and it's been successful to have those people attach their individual identities more to their political identities to establish their goodness as people right so they they there has been in effect through the the media climate more buy in from those people when uh, that, that, that compared to 30 years ago, right? Or compared to the certainly compared to the time Alinsky was writing in, because you could just pull your blinds down and hide in your house, yep. you know. But today, you have to like uh, something happens. You have to go on Facebook and say, "I'm so sorry this happened. This is how I feel about it. This is my sympathy to these people." <laughs> right. Like everybody has to do that now. Everybody is a media personality now. 30 years ago, you could just run and hide. My, my thoughts and prayers go out to you, Brett. Thanks. That's how I. That's how I. That's how I signal <laughs> that I care. No, I. I think everything that you said is probably is true, and I still think what I said is true too. Like they found a way to get those apathetic people to take a basically riskless stance on many many things. That's it. Yep. But they've also reduced the number of those goddamn people. Yeah. The, the yeah, middle class totally is just yeah. decimated. I'm starting to get my tinfoil hat. I mean, I, I think there's been, there's been a movement among people in power to reduce the number of those people. And whether there has been an active initiative to do that, it has happened. It certainly has happened. But Can I put my tinfoil hat on? Do it. All right. So in the WikiLeaks Podesta emails, <laughs> uh, which I, I, I was told I was not supposed to read, so I didn't read it. I absolutely did not read that Podesta said something about wanting a compliant population. Hmm. But if I had read that, I would think what aspects of modern culture, especially the big tech, is designed to make you compliant, to make you think. So virtue signaling, like you said, it, it's making you think you've done something. At, oh, oh, good. I fired off a nasty Facebook post about uh, Trump or something. So I did my job a- and then you go back to sleep and you go to Netflix and chill or you go, you know, whatever you think about marijuana use, all of a sudden it's everywhere. Essential business in my state. <laughs> the gym's shut down. The medical, dis- the marijuana dispensaries are open. The liquor stores are open, you know, everything that keeps your mood low, that makes you unlikely to form a revolution. All of that stuff is essential. 
so my tinfoil hat is, is that by design? Is it, it's designed to make us not be the sorts of people who would organize. Let me give you another uh, tinfoil hat moment. So this came out, this was in Business Insider. Make, make this one good. Wasn't the other one good? I make this one really good. I want you to bring in like <laughs> aliens, yeah, the lizard people. No, it's not aliens. It's Bezos. Oh, okay. Oh, he's an it's alien. Bezos. Clearly. So at the Whole Foods markets, which are the, the grocery stores that Amazon bought, they have a heat map of places that are most likely to unionize and least likely to unionize. And what they found, okay, what they found is the more diverse the workforce, the less likely they were to unionize. And that became company policy. So you make sure that your workforce isn't a bunch of guys of one ethnicity and cultural background, because those, they might get together and form a union. Whereas if you have, you know, 15 different ethnicities that don't really speak the same language and don't, they don't go out together on the weekends, they don't have barbecues, they're not going to organize. And so that became the design to make their workers compliant. And I wonder how many of those hacks do they have? That one was leaked. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, how much of Netflix, that binge watching thing, is designed to just make you sit there and watch a whole season of... of oh, my God. What are these shows? What, I, name a show. I don't know. A whole season of... Is Ozark. it Deadwood? Ozark. A whole season of Ozark. No, five seasons of Ozark. Mm. Yeah, well, I'm trying to get people to binge read. I've been using that. <laughs> I've been using that. That's my new rhetoric. Well, back to this book. <laughs> <laughs> right at page two or three or something like that. Few of us survived the Joe McCarthy Holocaust of the early 1950s. And of those, there were even fewer whose understanding and insights had developed beyond the dialectical materialism of orthodox Marxism. My fellow radicals who were supposed to pass the torch of experience and insights to a new generation just were not there. This is an explicit admission that McCarthy was right. <laughs> And that if he if McCarthy had been unopposed, he might have wiped Marxism out of the North America. Am I wrong? Oh, yeah. It's, uh, I don't know at what cost, right? It's hard to like. Li- like I never thought I would line up with McCarthy, but here you are. Would have been nice to get rid of that communism, though. Sure, would have been. <laughs> you, you know, we have to be completely intolerant of. I mean, we have to be completely tolerant of everything but intolerance, you know? And uh, that's a paradox that makes it really difficult to figure out how to act sometimes. But without dealing with that problem, you know, I went to public schools and they told us that the McCarthy thing was a, a moral panic and it was a red scare. And, you know, and they painted the whole thing like it was uh, like some wackadoo Nancy Reagan war on drugs kind of, I don't even, I mean, even dumber and weirder than that. But here it is. He says, right there, if you have survived it, that it removed radicals from the educational system, essentially, that would have been a tor- passing the torch of experience and insight to a new generation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, whatever kind of judgment we want to make about it. When I read that, I thought, yeah, well, my Harcourt, Brace, Johanovich, whatever, U.S. history textbook that I had in the 10th grade didn't say McCarthy the way that Alinsky did. Alinsky apparently saw him as a legit threat who was hip to him. Yeah, that was interesting. Can I go back to organizing? Let's. Let's organize. Let's do it right now. All right. So my tinfoil hat was that there are things that would make us less likely to organize, which presumes that I must think that organizing's good in some ways. Would locking you in your house do that? Yes. Well, this is the connection to my apathy comment too, right? Like all of the things that you're talking about promote apathy that Alinsky was supposedly trying to fight against. Yeah. So I was thinking, I want to put it in terms of something I think we all agree on, which is we're not a fan of government schools. And so you have to use some of these words. You have to raise awareness. You have to get people. You would like to get people who were content with sending their kids off to the government schools to be discontented, to be upset about it. And that when that happens, you can organize, you can have um, homeschool legal defense fund, you can have conferences, you can have all sorts of ways to promote homeschooling as an alternative that nobody's going to go to unless they're upset with the way things are. 
so you have to do this. And I'm one, and, and you might even use, you might even use some of their tactics, you know, finding a bad guy. Should you use them? I don't know, but some of them you should. And and what's the difference? So the re, the thing is, I think I think this is what Alinsky won't say is what his moral thinking is. I I think he might not think he has one, but I think, for example, organizing for self actualization and homeschool education is good for human beings because I have a, a a view of human nature that I think it is better for humans to not be government school, right? So I think that organization would be okay, whereas organizing for what would be a bad thing? Liberalization of the gambling laws? I don't know that that's bad. But organizing for some other purpose, at, <laughs> just to advance the mythical progress? Organizing for uh, euthanasia of everyone over 58. Yeah, see, I think that would be bad. For the greater good. <laughs> I think, <laughs> it, like the movie... Um, Logan's Run. There's probably somebody right now listening thinking, yeah, what's wrong with that? Logan's Run, you turn 30 and the thing changes color and you have to go turn yourself into the euthanasium. Well, so let's, let's talk about the homeschooling thing. So a couple of weeks ago, this Elizabeth Bartholet at Harvard published a paper about how <laughs> homeschooling was. I heard about that paper. I heard it dissected on a podcast. Yeah, our friend Brett Vinat might have had something to say about that. But she says that uh, homeschooling can lead to authoritarian parenting and that maybe it, it should probably be banned. And I don't know. What, a whole bunch of stuff. So since we're all homeschooling advocates, would it be right and just for us to go dig up some dirt on her, uh, hire a detective, go dig up some dirt on her, find out some nasty stuff in her past, paint her as the enemy, freeze the issue. She is literally, her being female and older and so on, we could actually personify her as an agent of the nanny state. We could make her the nanny of the <laughs> state and personally destroy her by personifying the problem in her in order to radicalize the moderates who are interested perhaps, and, you know, maybe their school's not real great and maybe they could homeschool, you know, would it be okay to do that? Would it be okay to burn her at the stake to get some more kids out of public school? And the answer is yes. Well, if the, if, oh. if the ends justifies the means, then I guess so. I would really hate it if somebody painted her as the face of the educational nanny state. <laughs> and uh, hired a detective and found out how many uh, indiscretions she had had when she was in college and aired. I would hate that. Well, you'd like to think, perhaps naively, you could take her down just by using her own arguments against her. Like that you wouldn't have to go through uh, a whole process of character assassination. You could just look at the arguments she makes, how shallow and misinformed they are, and say, this is an academic claiming to make a sound argument, here's why it's not sound, who does that resonate with? Mm -hmm. Well, the same choir I'm already preaching to, yeah. right? But it doesn't get beyond that right. because then the the media that is supportive of like, you know, people who are against homeschooling or the academic establishment or taxpayer funded this or that and more of it, like NPR, Vox or anybody else, Slate Salon, anybody else who picked up that story and ran with it as like, Experts say, here's what the experts say, homeschool leads to religious extremism or is for religious extremists and leads to abuse, right? That was basically how that could be um, summarized. So, yeah, I mean, the guy that I had on the show who is the uh, director of school choice for the Reason Foundation, his name's Corey DeAngelis. He roams around Twitter apparently all day. I mean, guy gets a lot done, but he also seems to have a whole bunch of time to roam around Twitter and look for people to go to war with. And then he screenshots those wars and reposts them and gets 100 likes, right? So he's he's effectively stirring the pot. He's looking for enemies. And it's like, here's the issue. He finds the, the enemies, just normal people on Twitter. A lot of times they're po politicians or academics. He takes them to war. And then he screenshots that. It, you know, uh, we're going to talk about Alinsky's tactics. A good, a good tactic is one your people enjoy, and people really enjoy that when he does that. I don't, I don't do that that much. I don't spend that much time on Twitter. I don't really like to argue with people on there. I like to post conversation starters like on Facebook and Instagram once in a while. 
But this guy, Corey, is looking to stir the pot, and he does it very effectively. So I think it comes down to, as far as outcomes are concerned, like division of labor. That's not how I want to use my time, but here's a guy who does that effectively, and I don't have any kind of moral or ethical judgment about what he's doing. Okay, I, I'm really frustrated because <laughs> on the one hand, I enjoy those tactics. <laughs> And uh, I think, for example, that was a huge part of the appeal of the current president is that he actually fights back forever. It's been the case that the the left will do these tactics on the right. Mm -hmm. And most of the polite and genteel uh, Republicans would, would just say, yeah, you're right. I am a scoundrel and I, I hate women and old people and want them all to die. Carl, there's another part of that, too, where in this ongoing race where the left would get a little bit ahead – they throw these banana peels over their shoulder like racist, sexist. And then, you know, Mitt Romney or whoever has to like slip around on it, go, no, 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 no. Let me explain. Let me explain. Well, they just keep running. Mm -hmm. And is there an equivalent going the other way? Yeah. Calling people communists or like Obama certainly took a lot of these attacks, uh, you know, scrutinized for his church goings and his uh, relationship with the weather underground and all these things. So it can go both ways. But yeah, we see that's a regular routine of um, there's this Mario racing game for Nintendo Mario Kart. And that mm -hmm. was one of the things you get in first place and you can deploy like oil slicks and Bananas. banana peels. And yeah, that's uh, that's what the left does with uh, racist, sexist, etc. Yeah. And so if you just follow Trump's Twitter feed, it's a lot of Alinsky tactics being done you know that if he tags you with a nickname you've got it forever <laughs> what would yours be my nickname yeah i gotta have to figure that out <sighs> carl the pa papist carl <laughs> <laughs> i don't know something he'd he'd identify me with two words you know right. like sleepy sleepy joe or whatever crooked hillary sleepy joe yeah and then i'm that forever he's defined me and it's funny and I'd, I'd say, but but wait, that's not true. But everybody's laughing at it. And now he's done the job. You know, it's, it's very Alinsky. I, I was thinking about meme culture when he talks about how ridicule is one of our most potent weapons. Everybody loves memes. I think that the whole lot of our, I, I don't know that you can call it debate because it's not really an argument, but a lot of our political debate is happening by memes nowadays. You can't really have a conversation anywhere. Lots of places will censor you. You can post a picture and it'll get a bunch of shares before the, it can be deemed dangerous and taken down. And the funnier, the better. Here's the troubling thing about this. You guys recently did a show on 1984. And when I was listening back to it, this, I mean, I hadn't read the book in like 15, 20 years. I'm thinking about this concept of Newspeak and how much more powerful that idea is after the observations of the last 15 years, right? How the idea of Newspeak, and I'm paraphrasing what Orwell says in the book, is to basically reduce the spectrum of possible human thought and analysis about something. Yeah, you know, I mean, that lines up with a lot of what Alinsky is is promoting as far as polarization is concerned, or angels and demons, or man what is the word, manichaeism, like the yeah. dark and the light. There's only one way to be. But we also see that in a lot of memes that are really popular, I'm sorry, they're stupid and they're reductive. You know, and that's even coming from like the side that I agree with. Like, I get that it's a meme. I get that a meme only has so much space to put information into it, but this is reductive and it's possibly, and even though it's fun, it's leading to misunderstanding. I don't know if memes, as much as we love them, are just, you know, forwarding and promoting newspeak. They're sowing that disorganization. They have to be uh, reductive to stir the pot. Okay, yeah. You know, if, you, if you're like, you know, here's my long-form nuanced uh, take on... Nobody reads it. You know, we need to talk about Aristotle's rhetoric at some point. He, he wrote this book, Rhetoric. And somewhere in there, he says, truth of it is, dialectic and logic doesn't work on most people. I believe that's true. You know, and, and people, libertarians, really want to make these you know, thoughtful, rational arguments for non-aggression and all of this stuff and sway people. And people don't care. They're like, are my kids going to have a good life? Am I scared to death of the HR department? Can't, how's my mortgage payment doing? They don't care about all that shit. 
You know, the dialectic in the argument just doesn't work in most cases. And Alinsky, in, in this in this entire book, it's only about 200 pages, by the way. You should go read it. You'll go look up Rules for Radicals, and you'll see some PDFs that are like just the rules from his tactics chapter. That's the only thing you'll see. There's much more here, dear listener. And you should go read it. He says nothing about making good arguments. He says nothing about dialectic. He says nothing about logic. Nothing. That's probably the last tool that he would use, and he would only do that if he had to. Because it's probably the biggest waste of time possible. <laughs> so Alistair McIntyre wrote a book called <laughs> After Virtue, where he, he points out that if you don't share if you don't share a common culture, you don't share a common way of thinking through problems, you can't appeal to reason. Because people don't share reason as a value. And the problem is that if you can't appeal to reason, we can't have an argument, can't have an actual debate. The only thing you have left is victory by any means necessary. When's the last time you saw a good debate between an establishment Republican and an establishment Democrat? where they actually got down to what they thought, what their starting points were, any points of agreement, points of disagreement, followed those out, checked out definition. When's the last time that happened? Never happened. We're still waiting. There? No. Yeah. I don't know. I think <laughs> Moynihan and somebody might have had a debate. I don't you know. know. Somebody silly, two, two people running from some city council seat somewhere may have done it. <laughs> you know? Sure. But, you know, if it's made it on network TV or something, No. No, what you see is I have talking points. I'm going to say it. I'm going to I'm going to freeze my opposition. I'm not even going to answer the question. Uh, reason has nothing to do with this. It's all tactics, and I, I don't like it, and I hate it, and I wish we wouldn't do it. But on the other hand, if you don't do it, you get steamrolled. Yeah, if you don't do it, you lose. That's why conservatives haven't conserved anything. They clutch their pearls and they try to maintain a certain sensibility. It, uh, conservatism in North America is mostly a, a an affectation of respectability. It doesn't really have a set of political <laughs> views. It's a decorum and a way of being because they've conserved p precisely nothing. Yeah, everything has been given Everything's up. been given up. They lose everything but their dignity. Alinsky says something in here about taking the high road and having to tuck your angel's wings under you as you sleep at night. And that's what the, the conservative movement since frankly about 68, since Buckley has done because they don't want to get dirty. They don't want to sink to their level. Oh, that's not, that's not who we are. They don't want to sink to the level and they don't want to actually be effective. Well, a lot of that appeared to change five years ago, you know, with the appearance of Trump. He's not a conservative. No, exactly. But I mean, he's he's aligned with that side. He's going to he's going to get labeled as such. Yeah, he's going to get. And well, I mean, I guess, yeah, I'm equivocating a little bit because we're talking about like if we're, we're just talking about right versus left. These were things that were basically alien from the right during that time yeah. because there was like less diversity on that side. Would you agree? Like just over the last half of the 20th century uh, and up through like George W. What does diversity mean? Diversity in that there wasn't a lot of diversity in thought in in what is considered the political right compared to what there is now, where there's still like there's paleocons, there's right leaning libertarians. Oh, there's lots of fun corners of the internet to go. Yeah, on the right. Yeah, the alt right, the neo reactionary. I mean, all of those things would be considered right of center, if not very right of center. That diversity of of thought and you know calls for action didn't exist even fifteen years ago. Things are certainly changing, and I think that one of these political parties is not going to come out of this. There might be something that has the name, the same old name, but it's one of them or maybe both of them are going to come out of this the way they were. Whatever happened to the Whigs? I don't know. I'm all for it. <laughs> the bull moose. The bull moose. Yeah. Yeah. I found really challenging uh, to me because I don't like, I think this is a poisoner's guide. It's like I had a discussion about Lord of the Rings with somebody on our Slack channel. And I, I said, you can't use the ring in a good way. He wanted to use it to, you can't use the ring. The ring is evil. And and I feel the same way about this book that at its core, I think it's probably a bad thing. However, the arguments on means and ends are really, really challenging that your conscience varies with you know like one over the interest you have in it mm -hmm. 
you know, if you have a lot of interest in the issue, then you don't have much conscious about it and you're going to beat up the other guys. Can you flesh you, that one out? A little yeah. Bit? So if I'm starving, uh, I don't care that there's a commandment that says I shouldn't steal. Right. I'm going to use any means necessary to feed me and my family. And, and any sort of moral qualms I might have, I, I'll probably, gosh, if we were starving, I might go to the neighbor's house and take their food if I could. Or at least it'd be a real hard debate in my mind as to whether to do it. Whereas right now, of course, I'm not going to do that because I have no interest because we're well fed at the moment. We got a big store of beans. I saw the, the COVID thing coming and, and bought a bunch of beans. You know, so we're good for a while. His comment that ethical concerns over means are directly proportional to the distance from the problem is is spot on just in your argument oh, about sure. the food it's just, it's spot on i've sat in ethics classes where we would debate um hiroshima right none of them are ever going to do this none of them were involved with the prospective invasion of japan it's very easy to sit back and say well no it should never have been done it's not so easy to say it should never have been done when you're looking at millions of dead uh, if you had to, I mean, they just on Okinawa, if you had to go through Japan house by house, oh my goodness, it, it makes it seem like maybe you still think it's wrong, but it becomes more and more of an option the closer you are to the actual situation. He actually takes up the Hiroshima argument, which is interesting. He says, you know, we did the Okinawa thing. We had subjected Japan to a unbroken string of humiliating defeats. And the war in Europe was over, and we were going to be able to bring all of that power to bear on them, yet we chose to use the bomb. He says that the bomb usage would have been better justified immediately after Pearl Harbor, and I actually don't think that's true. If you did it immediately after Pearl Harbor, you'd only be speculating about the violence and death ahead. We already, we, When they used it, they had evidence of it. I'm not saying it's right to have dropped it or not, but he says using it earlier would be an even better justification. and. This guy's just ethically shaky all over the place. I don't understand how his brain works at all. He, he's he's not like me in hardly any way. <laughs> it's I'm serious. I have a hard time relating to the guy. Uh, he says things I think are true. Like he, he drops a line here. We all have the strength enough to endure the misfortunes of others. You know, where he's <laughs> talking about ethical concerns about the ends or the means. He says the means and ends moralists or non-doers. He says that if you moralize about the means, you're really a non-doer. Yeah, you're allied with the haves. Yeah, you're aligning with the haves. He says they always end up on their ends without any means. Or how about this line? Uh, the most un this is page 26 uh, from that, that section of ends and means. The most unethical of all means is the non-use of any means. Which is libertarianism. Oh, mm. <laughs> mm. Shots fired. There's there's all kinds of a philosophical underpinning behind libertarianism, but it's basically we're not going to use government power for anything. Yeah, there's that. It's a completely inept, tail-chasing, I've been saying this on uh, Autistic Fever Dream, of a fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, so, so on the ends it means things, he, he lays out 11 rules, and these are not the rules for radicals. These are the rules, uh, just to, to make that clear, 11 rules on the ethics of means and ends. And then there are the 13 rules for radicals that we've just been kind of, uh, we've mentioned a few of them and we'll probably mention more of them as we go. But you read the first nine and there's some scary stuff in there. In, in war, the ends justify almost any means. But everything, as far as like public perception is concerned, all the first nine and all of their frightening aspects are concealed, I would say, by the last two. To even say it out loud, like, I'm, I'm sure this was great in 1971, but after observing the world since then, this is just so basic and obvious. Number 10 is you do what you can with what you have and then clothe it with moral arguments. Mm -hmm. That's basically every political action that we see. And then uh, the, the last one, goals must be phrased in general terms, like liberty, equality, fraternity, of the common welfare. So basically, clothe it in moral terms and add a slogan, and whatever happens before that, hey, whatever. Yep. And he says, once you name it with that slogan, success is assured. Yep. Right. How could you oppose liberty? <sighs> so, those two last rules. You still have this, the problem of the, the means and justifying those. This is where he's a relativist or, or postmodern. 
He says, the second rule of ethics of means and ends is that the judgment of the ethics of means is dependent upon the political position of those sitting in judgment. I think that the judgment would be dependent on something absolute and objective. I think there's a right and a wrong, and it doesn't matter who's sitting in judgment. There's a right or wrong, and if they say something that's wrong is right, they're just wrong. Like, their judgment doesn't go in my world. In his world, it goes, and it's right or wrong. It just, it just depends on who you are. It's a really good description of the way things are. I don't like it as prescriptive. And, you know, it's Republic Book One. Thrasymachus's definition, I live in Cook County, he's absolutely right. Justice is the will of the stronger. That's yeah. what this book is. But I don't like that conclusion, and so I'm really looking hard for a place to find justice that isn't in the will of the stronger. Because otherwise, I, I sort of do a reduction when I argue against it. You know, if you're, if you're right, Saul Alinsky, then where... Do we stop in our tactics? Well, you don't. If I could invent a a nanobot and put it in the water, that would kill every single one of my political opponents. Can we put it in a vaccine? Yeah, it's a nanobot. <laughs> oh, all right. Perfect. Okay. Okay. I'm on board. Okay. I'm taking notes. <laughs> but would you do it? Sure. You know, if there's no limit on tactics, then this is just a guide to tyranny. And... What arguments can you make against tyranny? Socrates makes an argument that you're just not a you're not a very happy person if you're a tyrant. So you have to put it back into self interest. Alinsky is on board with that that you have to appeal to people's self interest. But I just I shudder if he's right, then anything goes. And it everybody seems to believe he's right, and you can see in the politics that anything goes. So we agree that he's more of like. Like a lot of philosophers, probably, he's more of like a reporter than a pharmacist here, right? He's not writing scripts. He's kind of observing what's going on. And like I said, I, like I think he made a lot of observations during the 1960s, and he's kind of making it concrete in, in the structure of this book. Well, it's not just the 1960s. He always also draws a lot of his experience of organizing the, the stockyards community that was described in Upton Sinclair's book. Um, the sure. jungle and lessons from his mentors at the CIO, which later became, you know, merged with the AFL CIO. Uh, so he, he's drawing on labor organization and co communist organization in the United States in the depression era. He saw effective organization in the thirties. This is what I, this is the conclusion I drew from the book. This may not be right. And then he saw some fumbling and immature attempts after the McCarthy era among the student protesters and the civil rights movement. And he brought those lessons that concretely worked in the 30s forward, modernized them, codified them, and handed them off to the activists of the late 60s. Right. Yeah. I mean, a, a closer read had me rethinking a lot of the claims that I've made about like social media's impact as far as echo chambers and political division is concerned over the last decade. And, you know, the what he's observing is that these are political tactics mm -hmm. and perception management tactics. Like you're talking with with labor organization, you're talking more organizing and political tactics, but also with perception management tactics that have been in play for a long time. In that same section, <laughs> did you guys like his, de his references to the Declaration of Independence? Mm -hmm. uh, this is page 28. The Declaration of Independence as a declaration of war had to be what it was, a 100% mm -hmm. statement of the justice of the cause of the colonists and a 100% denunciation of the role of the British government as evil and unjust. Our cause had to be all shining justice, allied with the angels. Theirs had to be all evil, tied to the devil. In no war has the enemy or the cause ever been gray. Therefore, uh, from one point of view, the omission was justified, and from the other, it was uh, deliberate deceit. And then he has this phrase, oh, it's escaping me right now. You guys ever take too many notes for one of these oh, shows? Yes. That's all I do. Then I don't look at them. I just yell. I, I might have to admit that I lost it. It'll come back. Well, we could talk about the Declaration. He has a number of heroes that you would, th if you only know kind of the popular stuff about Alinsky, you've just seen the sort of 
you know, meme thing of the 14 or whatever steps, you know, where you freeze people and blah, blah, blah. You wouldn't know that one of his big heroes is Samuel Adams, very interested in the Declaration of Independence as a propaganda piece. Um, all, all that's pretty alarming. He, he talks about Churchill. He says that Churchill made a remark to his private secretary a few hours before the Nazis invaded the Soviet Union. Uh, he says, informed of the imminent turn of, of events, the secretary inquired how Churchill, the leading British anti-communist, could reconcile himself to being on the same side as the Soviets. Would not Churchill find it embarrassing? Blah, blah, blah. He says, not at all. I have only one purpose, the destruction of Hitler, and my life is much simplified thereby. If Hitler invaded hell, I would make at least favorable reference to the devil in the House of Commons. He has all kinds of unlikely heroes and uh, sees his methods in surprising places. One of those is the Declaration of Independence. Always for methods and never for morals. Always for destruction. Well, okay, so this was this is what I was actually searching for, page 43 into 44. All great leaders, including Churchill, Gandhi, Lincoln, and Jefferson, always invoked moral principles to cover naked self-interest in the clothing of freedom, equality of mankind, a higher law than man-made law, and so on. This even held under circumstances of national crises when it was universally assumed that the end justified any means. All effective actions require the passport of morality. That was the phrase I liked, the passport of morality. Oh, gosh. It's such an abyss that opens up if you go down this road. Mm. Well, okay, Carl. Does this work? I'm going to be a utilitarian. Does this work? No, I'm going to be a pragmatist. <laughs> what, his method? Does his playbook work? Yeah. Uh, absolutely, but... What do you mean by work? Well, is he able to bring about, can he identify a change that that he wanted to bring about, a social or political change that he wanted to bring about, use his playbook, and have a very, very high likelihood, a light, more a higher likelihood of bringing that change about than had he used other means? Yes. I think so, too. So is this the best playbook? Uh, it's a playbook I don't want to use because I still think there's such a thing as morality well then we lose yeah i know that's why the means end stuff was real challenging to me scott yeah i know i know <laughs> because it i is, don't like losing it is for me too you know tolkien calls about talks about the long defeat you know right yeah i don't want to lose i i get frustrated when the people that i think are somewhat amenable to my way of thinking roll over <laughs> uh i i wish they would be meaner Right. But there, there's got to be a line, I suppose, on how mean you can be. But you have to fight in Catholic theology, which you guys might not care about. There's a whole lot of debate over just war theory. Yeah. Okay? It, you can write endless papers about just war theory. You can get them published. They're just about the only people outside of West Point that care about it. It's very interesting that they pick that up. And they don't care about it when they're actually fighting a war. It's what you do after the war. <laughs> you say, well, was the firebombing of Dresden in accord with Catholic just war theory? And you can write a paper on it. it but it's pointless. If you're the, the general on the ground making the decision, you're using whatever tool, you're doing what Alinsky says, you're using whatever tool will get you the victory. And then the victors can argue over whether they were moral or not. A victory is evidence of your rightness. The good guys always win. He says, you use the moral code of your enemies against them, which I have seen all the time. I, I found it funny. Uh, so I, I've grown up in the Chicago area and dealt with Chicago Catholic Church for a long time. And apparently all those guys went to school with him. <laughs> and you'd have the same thing. You'd have a, a, a progressive pastor doing some crazy thing and the parishioners get upset. And then the progressive pastor, the bishop says, it's unchristian of you to be so upset. You know, a good Catholics must submit to their bishops. You know, so <laughs> where the, the bishop isn't being, isn't living according to his rules and he's doing things that violate his traditions, but then he insists that the people follow the traditions. You know, so that was the thing that Alinsky says. If, if you're going against people who, like the incident when somebody caught him with a young lady, he doesn't care about it. Go ahead, publish it. I thought she was good looking. Never claim to be celibate but, celibate, but if you're organizing against the, the Southern Baptist Association in your town and you can show that the minister's got a girl on the side, you run with it. 
because he cares, or at least he pretends to care and his people care. Or, or if you read Alinsky's playbook, you try to apply that to Trump and he says, what are you talking about? I thought she was hot. And then it just rolls off. It's, <laughs> it's fascinating. It's so funny to watch. <laughs> I mean, he was perfectly primed for it, too, because all of these other people who are trotted out as leaders and respectable were like Barack Obama, you know, who in many ways we could say is a student of, of certain aspects of, of Alinsky in his community organizing career, was sort of a manufactured political candidate. Uh, Trump was an entertainer. Trump walked around with supermodels and WWF wrestling. And I mean, like he was primed to just have any any attack that they could throw at him, even though I think he is very good at utilizing many principles in this book, whether he's read it or not. Somebody advising him has read this book, unless this is just instinct. He did real estate in New York City, I think probably yeah. he had to. Yeah. Uh, Not read it, but had to know this stuff. So he's dealt with prostitutes, porn stars, the mafia, New York City government. I mean, he's been involved in all of these shady circles, and America came to know him as a super rich guy and, more importantly, a celebrity and an entertainer. He's kryptonite, man. He didn't have any of that that expectation that comes with being Mitt Romney or Barack Obama or John mm -hmm. McCain, all of the things that would destroy those people are just like, yeah, that's that's Trump. Trump's going to Trump. Yeah, basically. so he's, he's creatively amoral. Mm -hmm. Carl, back to your arguments about the morality of the, the use of these tactics. Now, these tactics uh, are about disrupting existing power structures. He says so. He's like, you look for the power. And he talks about, uh, early in the book, he talks about a bunch of words that are that are fraught. Like organizing, he says, unfortunately, is just almost entirely aligned with the old stodgy communist ideals. And he says, it's unfortunate that, that that's the case. And he talks about words like self-interest and others. And he, he tries to remove some stigma from some of these words uh, in, in an argument to get people to use his tactics. So one of the words he talks about is power. And he's like, you know, power is power is what it is and it's everywhere. Um, and it gets you fed and uh, is really behind everything that happens. His tactics are about disrupting power. Now, what if the immoral now are in power? Right? Like if you're a genuinely, if you genuinely believe that we are governed by pizza eating lizard people, <laughs> and you can use their broken morality against them, because he says, you know, hold them to their rules. Hold them to their rules, and you can use their broken morality against them in smearing them, you know, like I made the example of the, the lady at Harvard that wrote this, the essay on homeschooling. All the smears are real. Is it okay then? Like if you're really in your heart and in your mind believe that you're fighting pure evil and that the pure evil has the power, and the only tool that you have left would be in this book, now are we okay? Can we do it now? We're we're better. Um, so what was her name? <laughs> Elizabeth Bartholet. Uh, what you know? Everything's in distinctions, right? right. As they say in the Middle Ages, I, I I must make a distinction here. What was her name? Bartholet, mm -hmm. or what was the other guy? Dwyer, the the guy who said that the state lends your children out to you. Mm. <laughs> Jim Dwyer. Yep. Yep. James Dwyer. Yep. Yeah. I think What's I've read address? some of his stuff before. <laughs> I don't know his home no. address. You could say true things, and you could say them in a funny way and use tactics that work, but that are true. And I think that would be okay. Now it would have a bad effect on Elizabeth Bartholet's ability to pursue her academic career to show that the paper was a bunch of garbage, a dumpster fire of a paper, but she wrote it. You know, you're just exposing what she is. You're not saying that, you know, she had a dead prostitute in the trunk of her car unless she did. If you could take the, the very good thoughts on tactics, I, I think there's probably some things you shouldn't do. Were there any things that Alinsky would say you shouldn't do? Things that are illegal. Things that get, no, things that get you too long of a prison sentence. Mm. Yeah. There you go. A short prison sentence is useful because now you're a martyr and you have some time to write. But a long prison sentence wouldn't be good. I'm hoping we get to go through these. There's 13. Oh, let's do it now then. 
I would like it if like one of the three of us could come up with uh, a modern example for each one, which might be a tall order. Because here's the thing. I think that some of them might not be as applicable in this world. Mm. Is that fair? Uh, mm -hmm. Well, let's go. I don't know. Uh, by the way, so th there are these rules. I've already mentioned it, and I think these are the ones you're going to read. They're in his tactics chapter. Th if you just Google this, you're going to find the list of rules from tactics. But this book is full of listicles, <laughs> his ethical rules and, and, and so on, full of these listicles. And they're all very good and very interesting, even if he's nuts. There you go. Right. So I was just saying, you know, you can take the principles and the tactics out of the, the context of the technological limitations of the 60s and 70s and scale a lot of these things to the current age, but maybe not all of them quite as well. So we might struggle to find modern day examples of, of some of these things. Do you want me to start? Sure. All right. Power is not only what you have, but what the opponent thinks you have. If your organization is small, hide your numbers in the dark. Harder to do today, obviously, and raise the din that will make everyone think you have. Yeah, astroturfing, Twitter bots. We are the 99%. Yeah, no, you're not, but <laughs> feels like you are. Number two. Oh, this is, I like this one a lot. I mean, I don't like it. I like that it's written down uh, and it's something we can talk about. Never go outside the experience of your people. The result is confusion, fear, and retreat. Yeah, that's why Jeb Bush couldn't win. Jeb Bush doesn't know anything about the experience of humans. Well, I mean, I think experience, doesn't experience also include like depth of knowledge here? Because I would say a good example of this from the 2016 presidential, well, the, the Trump campaign was the wall, right? Like the wall is something that's tangible. I have a fence. You can picture it. Fences are like walls? Yeah. Huh. Close your eyes. You can picture it. You can reach out and kind of, is it brick? Is it, what is it? It's a wall, so it's hard. You know, like it, that's something you can see. It's obviously going to be much more effective than the complicated ways of analyzing, uh, you know, immigration issues, which other politicians tried to do before that, and they got nowhere. Wall, four-letter word. People love that, right? So it was not going beyond anybody's experience you're right like we've seen walls we have walls but also reduced to like a level of understanding that was accessible to everybody and i think that an inability to relate those to, to those personal experiences like that is why hillary was never going to win without voter fraud don't at me <laughs> like just yeah. uh, and jeb had a lot of the same problems just wooden as hell um has lived just a very unusual, rarefied life, just unrelatable. If Jeb had had a cult of personality around him, he would have done better, and he, but he didn't, and then he, you know, low-energy Jeb, and he's gone. That was the quickest. You know, if you just love tactics and don't care about, you know, the right or wrongness of any of this, that, that zinger from Trump destroyed him. It was a nuclear bomb, low energy. Which is what he is. Gone. He's gone. It completely destroyed. I've never seen anything like it. Oh, it's wonderful. He he actually might be an energetic person, but again, that conservative sensibility of decorum and restraint comes off as low energy, and it wrecked him because he would have had to have had less decorum to shake that off. The way he should have shaken that off is gotten super mad at him and called him a, a, some names. You know, how dare you? These are all the things I've done while you were there in your Louis the Fourteenth revival uh, penthouse up there screwing models. This is what I was doing. <laughs> I've been polite. You call it low energy. That's over. But he didn't do it because he can't. He gave a low energy response. Because he, he, that's the only thing he could do, yeah. which is the third rule. Yeah. Go outside the experience of the enemy. Yeah, Jeb can't do that. He couldn't get outside that. I usually don't get very political but i think i think trump's twitter feed is outside the experience of the enemy they've never seen anything like it mm -hmm. they don't know how to deal with it uh they let it get under their skin do you read replies to his twitter feed ever no i i try to avoid twitter it's astounding it's astounding nobody knows what to, what to do with it i don't care where you are on the spectrum like if you read the replies to his tweets 
they're all just short circuited. This is probably like Trump's Twitter feed is probably the best example of the execution of this rule that I've ever seen. Uh, right. So as the left has gotten away with 30 years when it comes to dealing with Republicans, banana peels over the shoulder, just slipping and falling. Trump picks them up. He puts them in his Mr. Fusion and he just <laughs> shoots off into the future. Right. He just like keeps going. Right. It's just power to him. It's just energy to him. It's fuel. <laughs> Mr. Fusion. Yeah. If I was the president, here's what I would do to do that. I would not have another press conference ever again. Yeah. I would say, uh, hey, send your questions to <laughs> questions at whitehouse.gov, and I'll be answering them on Facebook Live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for one hour. Your questions will be chosen at random by a random number generator. I'll do it with a screen share. Dude, <laughs> what would they do? It would disrupt Every single thing about the the political environment in the United States. It would destroy everything about it. The, the presidential election process with the debates, with Concrite or Anderson Cooper or whoever the heck moderating this or that, people mediating your experience of him speaking, it would completely wreck it. Listen, Trump, I know you listen to our show. <laughs> Stop doing those GD press conferences and do what I'm telling you. And then nobody could even run against you unless they could do jazz on an open form Q&A in an unmoderated place like that. Well, that would certainly be fun. I love that. Yeah. That would be fun. Uh, Brett, should we do number four? Yeah, sure. Four is make opponents. We talked about this one a little bit already. Make opponents live up to their own book of rules. And then like uh, one line that I pulled from the book, you can kill them with this for they can no more obey their own rules than the Christian church can live up to Christianity. Yeah, I might have lol with that. <laughs> yeah. That's the stuff you were talking about, the banana peels. You, you call these conservatives who are con so concerned about their sensibility and their image and their decorum, and you call them a name like racist or misogynist or whatever, and they just gasp and grab their own throats. They, they, they're, they're completely paralyzed by it because they are about propriety, stability, sensibility, and being good, good. They were the good kids in school. They were good boys and girls. The converse of this rule is don't have rules. So you be like Alinsky or you be like uh, Trump. Um, I'm trying to think of other politicians like this that I know there's some in Europe. There was a guy in Italy who was having parties with strippers and, you know, it's like, whatever, I don't care. Silvio, yeah. whatever his name was. Yeah, Berlusconi, yeah. <laughs> this might be a consequence of that rule. If if they're going to hang you on your rules, then you just don't have any. <laughs> right. I, I never claim to be moral, but I'm going to fight for my people. That's your tagline. And no matter what scandal they catch you in, you, I don't care. I'm not sure that's a desirable correlation. I don't think that's a... And if you're going to get in trouble anyway, like like if you have legit political uh, aspirations and enemies, you're going to get in trouble. They're going to make something up if they have to. Like, oh, he told a fart joke on the school bus. He's in fourth grade. Let's go. Let's get him. You know, there, I mean, something's coming. So the only way that you can do deal with it really is to be just completely impervious to it and just completely ignore it. And once you, once you're willing to do that now, now anything that you want to do is open to you. Well, if you're going to be attacked as a, if you're the president, you're going to be attacked every day, even when you do the finest, best possible thing and, and pursue the highest good and the highest truth every single day, but they're still going to excoriate you. You know, why not just go ahead and napalm that village? <laughs> It's all the same. <laughs> At least here on Earth, it's all the same. Well, I wouldn't napalm a village, but I was thinking I mean, of... Uh, you know what I mean. The, if you're going to get your ass yeah. kicked, do whatever you want anyway. But if part of the question is, why is Trump doing this? I think the next three rules that we're going to get to, um, we'll, we'll get to them in a second, but we'll explain one of his motivations very well. Uh, sorry, Carl. No, I, I was just thinking of Emerson's line, a foolish consistency is a hobgoblin of a little mind. People accuse you of being inconsistent. Well, you, I think you, productively you should just not care. You should say, well, I'm thinking today, and this is what I think today, mm -hmm. and I'm not bound mm -hmm. by what I thought last week. Yeah, John Kerry suffered greatly 
uh, for this, for for simply saying I was for it until I was against it, right? Or I voted for it before I voted against it. And the term that was coined was flip-flopper. Right. Mm-hmm. Over the period of 10 years, it is inexcusable that you would change your mind mm-hmm. about something. Right. So that's rule four used against him. Had he yeah. accused yeah. other people of flipping? I bet he had. I don't remember a particular. Number five, ridicule is man's most potent weapon. Pocahontas. <laughs> There's nothing you can do. It's not like you can mount any sort of rational argument against ridicule. All you can do is do the same thing back with a uh, defensive, like, insecure posture. This, my, right? my kids do this all the time. I do it, too. And when other people see us do it, they think we're nuts. Somebody will say, uh, hey, go get me a cup of coffee. And they're like, you're a cup of coffee. <laughs> we do it all the time. This ridicule does this. So if Trump says to um, Elizabeth Warren, Pocahontas, and then she says, well, you're an orange man. Like anything she says after that's dumb. Like there's nothing she can do if she calls him, you know, syphilitic Don or I mean, whatever she wants to call him, none of it's going to work because he got there first. Right. I have a response to it. I think what you should do, I, I'm thinking of what the cool kids in grade school and high school did. I wasn't one of them, but I I knew some of them. And if you made fun of them, they wouldn't get mad and they wouldn't necessarily respond back. They'd probably laugh. Sure. And then forget about it. So you orange man bad. So you say, uh, oh, I guess my skin is kind of orange today. And then you go about doing what you're doing and you've completely diffused it. It's when you get mad at the thing that's said about you that they've got you. you if you laugh at it, you know, I do have small hands. Uh, Orange is the color of success. <laughs> I don't know how Warren would have dodged the, the Pocahontas quip. I don't think you can do anything about it. I don't know how she could have laughed at that. You could respond all you want, but you've already been painted. Your response doesn't even matter. Yeah. I mean, it, it can mitigate. You're just reacting. You're it, just reacting. You're just reacting. Boy, boy, he got her. It can mitigate it and make it better, Carl, for sure. She she yeah. didn't do as good a job as she could have with that. But boy, once you're tagged, you're tagged. Pocahontas. You're a Pocahontas. Anything <laughs> that would have been the good response. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Whatever you say after that's just Orange Ahontas. Right. I don't know. All right. So five is ridicule is man's most potent weapon. Six is related, I would say. A good tactic is one your people enjoy. I think this is why he does these media mix ups. Or mixing it up with the media. Because like, the people who love Trump, they're watching a press conference and they're like, get to the part where Jim Acosta mm-hmm. from CNN asks him a question. Get to the part. <laughs> get to that part. That's what I want to see. Show me highlight clips of that. Show me a YouTube mashup of Trump destroying CNN reporters. You know, even though number seven is a tactic that drags on too long, becomes a drag, this one doesn't seem to get old. Mm-mm. Like Trump versus the media. An inverse tactic that I suppose the other side enjoys is the canceling. You know, yeah. combing through your Twitter feed, finding something you said in 2011, publishing it, getting you canceled. They seem to really, really like that. Oh, they enjoy it. Yeah, they enjoy it. I, I don't like that they like it, but they, boy, they sure do. Well, there's, and there's meme magic too. You know, there's one group of people that just, man, they just love the memes. They love, you know, Twitter, Twitter coming up to the uh, 2016 election was amazing the yep. memeing and um the, that weird twitter political activism that frankly i don't think trump could have won without was just amazing to watch and people were it was having too much fun to oh, be allowed people to people were having so much fun with it right so if you look like this is one of the reasons why i think he became the president of the united states if you look at rules five six and seven together right ridicule is a man's most potent weapon obviously little marco lion ted low energy jeb look at how funny Rand paul looks uh was that the worst he had for Rand paul th- th- Rand paul actually had the best response to trump of all the only person who stood a, a chance against him trump said I haven't said anything about his appearance, and believe me, there's plenty of material there. And the camera just cuts to Ron, uh, Rand Paul, and he rolls his eyes, and it cuts away. That's it. That's how you respond. Yeah, yeah. I have a fair bit of respect for the for the junior senator from Kentucky. I, I love his festivist rants. Yeah. Whatever you think of him, he's very funny. 
So with ridicule as man's most potent weapon, five, a good tactic is one your people enjoy and a tactic that drags on too long becoming a drag. Trump is in this perfect situation in 2016 where he has 18 people to come up with nicknames for and make fun of and rip apart on stage. So it never gets old. Everybody loves it. And it's all based on ridicule. And then once all those people are out of the way, oh, what a joy. You still have Hillary Clinton to deal with.